This is a, a series of videos on hermeneutics, the art and science of biblical interpretation by me. My name is Dr. Joe Sprinkle. The current video is on an introduction to Hebrew poetry, which is a prelude to understanding the poetic and prophetic books. And uh, so it's the hermeneutics of the special, special hermeneutics of the genre of poetry in the Old Testament. Now, one of the great advances in biblical scholarship of the 18th century was the discovery that a large portion of the Old Testament was poetic. The pioneer in this field is the man pictured here, Robert Loth who wrote a book in uh, eight, uh, 1753, Lectures on the Sacred Poetry of the Hebrews. Uh, his work on Hebrew poetry demonstrated that there was much more poetry in the Bible than had yet been uh, understood. The King James Bible was produced before Los seminal work, and as a result, it does not distinguish between poetry and prose, printing everything in verses as if it were poetry. And this, of course, misleads the, the reader. But we cannot blame the translators because they did their work before Loth brought to the attention of scholars just how much of the Hebrew Bible is poetry. The guideline in interpreting poetry is to recognize that a passage is poetic and to understand how Hebrew poetry works and knowing the special rules for interpreting poetry. Those are all important elements in interpreting poetic passages of the Old Testament. Now, just how much of the Bible is poetic? Well, in the Old Testament, there are six poetical books, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, and Lamentations. And everybody uh, knew all along that these books were poetic. But then you also have prophetic books that have a great deal of poetry. For example, Isaiah and Hosea and Joel and Amos are written primarily in poetry, and many of the other prophetic books have uh, significant uh, poetic sections. But you also even have poetry in some of the historical books. So, for example, uh, Jacob's uh, blessing on his children in Genesis 49 is written in poetry. Uh, the Song of Moses in Exodus 15 is written in poetry. Uh, the Song of Deborah in Judges chapter 5 is also written in poetry. And every now and again in the narratives, you get a little poetic part. So Samson gives a riddle in poetry. Out of the eater came something to eat. Out of the strong came something sweet, which is Judges 14.14. 14. And he uh, jumps into, right, into verse uh, in poetry, into that particular uh, verse. When you add it all together, somewhere between one third and one half of the Old Testament is written in poetry. And therefore it's important to know something about how Hebrew poetry works. What are some characteristics of Hebrew poetry? Well, Hebrew poetry lacks some things that uh, English poetry has. Uh, for example, Hebrew poetry lacks rhyme, and Hebrew poetry lacks strict meter. Uh, and so, you know, in English poetry, you could take a, a song like, uh, a poem like, roses are red, violets are blue, sugar is sweet, and so are you. And, uh, of course, you have uh, blue and you rhyming, and it has a strict meter, da-da-da-da, da-da-da-da. Da 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 da. Roses are red, violets are blue, sugar is sweet, and so are you. Uh, and so that's what you expect from English poetry. And of course, uh, it's not always true, even in English poetry. There is such a thing as uh, blank verse, which uh, lacks rhyme, and free verse that lacks strict meter. And in other languages, there's uh, French and German poetry. 
uh, Alexandrine uh, poetry that has 12 syllables and Japanese uh, haiku poetry that also counts syllables. But nonetheless, typically poetry in English rhymes and has strict meter, but Hebrew poetry lacks that. What Hebrew poetry does tend to have is a phenomenon known as parallelism. Parallelism is the distinctive feature of Hebrew poetry. So let me go through some of the types of parallelism that you can find in the Bible. Uh, one type of parallelism is synonymous parallelism. Synonymous parallelism is where the same thought is repeated in the second line of poetry using different but synonymous terms. So for example, in Psalm 105 and verse 23, then Israel came to Egypt, Jacob sojourned in the land of Ham. So parallel with Israel is Jacob. Those are two names with the same patriarch in the Old Testament. And then it comes, both of the terms can mean the descendants of Israel, the descendants of Jacob. Parallel with Egypt is land of Ham. If you look back in the uh, genealogies in, uh, in uh, Genesis uh, 10, you'll find that the descendants of Ham uh, ended up uh, migrating to uh, Africa primarily, and that would include Egypt. And so Egypt and uh, the land of Ham are synonyms in this particular context, Egypt being a part that represents uh, the whole of the land of Ham, uh, synecdoche. Um, and so, um, uh, at least for poetic purposes, Egypt and Land of Ham are uh, uh, synonyms. So that's synonymous parallelism. Then you have another type of parallelism known as antithetical uh, parallelism. Uh, antithetical parallelism uh, balances uh, parallel lines through opposition or contrast of thought. And it uses opposite words, antonyms, in order to express its thoughts. So, for example, in Psalm 190 and verse 6, in the morning it flourishes and is renewed. In the evening it fades and withers. And so opposite of morning is evening. Opposite of flourishing is fading. Opposite of being renewed is withering. And so you have uh, opposite ideas that are expressed in uh, antithetical parallelism. So the first line of poetry is being contrasted in the second line of poetry. And you have other examples of antithetical parallelism. For example, Proverbs 10 and verse 4, lazy hands make a man poor, but diligent hands bring wealth. So lazy versus diligent, poor versus wealth. Or uh, Proverbs th uh, 10 and verse 30, the righteous will never be uprooted, but the wicked will not remain in the land. So you have righteous, opposite of which is wicked, being uprooted is as opposed to remaining in the land. Yet another type of parallelism is called emblematic parallelism. Emblematic parallelism is similar to uh, synonymous parallelism, but it involves a metaphor or a simile. An example of uh, emblematic parallelism that involves a metaphor or a simile is uh, Psalm 103 and verse 13, as a father pities his children, so the Lord or Yahweh pities, pities those who fear him. Now there is parallelism going on. Uh, Father and Yahweh are parallel, but they're not equal. Uh, Yahweh is like a father. So uh, it uses a simile, as a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those that fear him. And then parallel with the father's children are those that fear God. Uh, and so it's close to synonymous parallelism, but it's making a comparison in the first line of poetry uh, is being compared with the, the second line of poetry. Or uh, 
in Psalm 42, as a deer longs for the water brook, so my soul longs for you, O God. Uh, so a deer and me and uh, water brooks and God are being compared, but uh, they're not strictly synonymous as analogy, uh, using usually a simile, sometimes a metaphor. Another type of parallelism is incomplete parallelism. Incomplete parallelism is a parallelism in which each line has the same number of terms, but only some of the terms actually parallel. For example, Psalm 21, verse 10, you will destroy their offspring from the earth and their children from among the sons of men. Now, the verb you will destroy is not repeated in the second line of poetry, even though, uh, especially in the Hebrew, the length of the lines of poetry are similar. Uh, but it allows the verb of the first line of poetry to kind of do double duty, as it were. And so uh, uh, you have offspring parallel with children and uh, from the earth and from mankind. Um, those two are, have parallels, but you will destroy does not have a parallel. And so that is incomplete parallelism. And then there's what is called stair-step parallelism that shows progression of thought, repeating part of the previous line, but extending the idea in each successive line. Uh, so for example, in uh, Psalm 29 and verse 1, ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength, ascribe to the Lord the glory of his name. And each one of them have an exact word that's parallel, uh, ascribe to the Lord. But then it says, who is to ascribe, heavenly beings? It says uh, what they're to describe or how they're described, glory and strength. And uh, the last line, how much glory and strength, the glory of his name, meaning the glory that his name deserves. And so each line of poetry is expanding the ideas of the previous line of poetry. And uh, you just keep progressing, going uh, up and up and up. And uh, the idea is kind of like going up a stair step. Uh, stair step parallelism is the name that's given to this category. But then you have a phenomenon known as chiastic parallelism. Chiastic parallelism is like the other kinds of parallelism, except there's an inversion in the order of the items in the second line. And so if you have item A and item B in the first line, you will have a B prime and an A prime opposite order in the parallel line. Uh, the example here is Psalm 51 and verse one, have mercy on me, O Lord, according to thy steadfast love, according to thy abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. So uh, parallel with have mercy is what he means by have mercy is blot out my transgressions in the second line of poetry. But that's at the end of the line, not at the beginning. Whereas what's at the end of the first line, according to your steadfast love, is at the beginning of the second line, according to your abundant mercy. So you have an A, B, B prime, A prime pattern. And if one were to connect the A with the uh, A prime and the B with the B prime, you'd uh, have a X or the Greek letter chi, and that's why it's called chiastic parallelism. Sometimes you can have as many as three terms of for example, in uh, Psalm 147 and verse 4, uh, it says uh, that he counts the number for the stars, for all of them names he calls out. Well, parallel with he counts is he calls out, A and A prime. Parallel with the number is their names. Uh, and then parallel with for the stars is for all of them. So you get an A, B, C, C prime, B prime, A prime. By the way, this is how the Hebrew word order works. Most English translations garble uh, 
uh, the Hebrew word order when they translate it so that you can't see the chiastic parallelism, uh, but uh, I'm uh, pointing it out uh, orally here. So that's chiastic parallelism. Uh, it's either an ABBA or an ABC, CBA. Uh, it could get even more elaborate, but this is typically uh, the patterns that you see. And then you have finally a category called synthetic parallelism. It's match pairs of line, but, but there's really no real parallelism that's here. For example, in uh, Psalm 2, uh, it talks about uh, uh, that uh, you have a whole series of uh, synonymous parallelisms. Uh, you know, why do the nations conspire and why do the peoples uh, plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, uh, all going in parallel with each other. Let us break their chains and throw away their fetters. Uh, the one enthroned in heaven laughs, the Lord scoffs at them. Then he will rebuke them in his anger and terrify them in his fury. But then you get this line, but as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. Now you get this sing-song synonymous parallelism in verses 1 and twice in 2 and 3 and 4 and 5, and then suddenly you get this line where there is no parallelism. I have installed my king, there's nothing there. Um, and so uh, this is called synonymous parallelism. It's when you throw together match pairs of lines, <coughs> but there's no real parallelism. Now, in this particular case, it may have been done uh, for the purpose of um, bringing a, a unit to an end. So it kind of uh, um, brings an abrupt end of synonymous parallelism and brings you to a full stop before you uh, start the next unit of the psalm where you have a, actually a change of speakers uh, that the king himself will speak starting in verse seven. Well, how is poetry interpreted differently than po prose? And there's several things we need to point out. One is that poetry abounds in figurative language. It likes to use lots of uh, metaphorical languages. So in Psalm, uh, uh, Psalm 114 and verse four, the mountains skipped like rams and the uh, hills like uh, lambs. And so you have mountains uh, dancing around. Well, mountains don't uh, dance around, that's hyperbole. Uh, and it uses a simile uh, like rams. Uh, you get a lot of figurative language, and that figurative language will make poetry a bit more difficult to interpret than straight prose that tends to say more directly uh, and use less figurative language in what it has to say. Um, and you do need to take parallelism into uh, account. And so where you have parallelism, uh, you need to notice that there are parallel lines of poetry uh, and so, uh, for example, uh, uh, you have a, a passage in Psalm 35, the redeemed of the Lord shall return and the ransom will come back to Zion. And I once heard a uh, preacher say that, well, redeemed is one group of people and the ransom are another uh, group of people. And what he didn't recognize was that that was simply, simply uh, synonymous parallelism. And there was uh, no need to uh, uh, see a contrast because redeemed and ransom are uh, being used in a synonymous way. And we should understand that the Psalms are a hymn book and not a book of systematic theology. Uh, it, you don't read a hymn book the way you read a, uh, a book of uh, systematic theology. It has plenty of theology in it. And it has material for constructing a systematic theology, uh, but it, uh, uh, it is not written in that kind of way. Now, why is uh, 
so much of scripture written in a poetical way. Well, uh, poetry expresses that which is difficult to express. Sometimes it's hard to say something in prose, but if you put it in poetry, you can get at the idea better than having to spell it out in lots of words. You can use imagery and illusion uh, to express the idea. So poetry expresses that which is difficult to express. Uh, poetry appeals to a person differently than prose does. It adds color and interest to what is read. It draws us into the drama and the emotions. It stimulates our imaginations. You might say that prose appeals to the head. Poetry addresses the head through the heart. And poetry combines beauty with truth. Uh, it's good to have truth, but truth expressed beautifully is even better. And poetry allows that to happen. You can combine beauty with truth. And then poetry is more memorable than prose. You can uh, memorize a song a lot better than you can uh, uh, memorize a speech. And poetry is also especially appropriate for worship, which is why you find so much poetry uh, in the Psalms. It is important to have uh, poetry. It, it appeals to the emotions. Every emotion that's imaginable is found in the poetry of the Psalms, for example, uh, contempt and awe and despair and doubt and love and shame and joy and courage. Uh, it's enriching uh, what poetry uh, can uh, do for us. So that's a introduction to the special hermeneutics of Hebrew poetry. And uh, my name is Dr. Joe Sprinkle.